Apple's chip expert joins Samsung as director for New Packaging Solution Center. An Apple expert, an individual working at Apple, goes to work at Samsung. An Apple employee and a Samsung employee walk into a bar. Of course, this thing goes on and happens, and along with those individuals goes all kinds of trade secrets that aren't on a hard drive somewhere, but instead mm. are in the hard drive of the mind. What now? It's impossible. Like, yeah, of course this stuff takes place. And I'm reading through this article. Obviously, Apple's been crushing it in the chip category. Mm -hmm. M this and M that. And other companies are going to aim to replicate and they're going to try to hire the talent responsible or any talent associated with it in an effort to maybe not replicate, but to possibly infuse their own products. Yeah. I always wonder about that. With an infusion. Well, they sign NDAs, right? And NDAs and... And all, all this variety of privacy components and it's all very strict but at the same time if a person worked intimately on a project they may not be able to talk about it specifically but there's going to be learnings yes trade secrets i just gonna be learnings mm -hmm. it's gonna be hard to avoid what's funny though about the apple and samsung relationship is that it's not it's obviously competitive but it's not um, it's not without some degree of cooperation because they work together on products. Mm -hmm. Apple is also Samsung's client. I don't know that, I don't know if Samsung is, or I don't know that Samsung buys from Apple. We, we of course know that Apple uses products from Samsung in its devices or has historically. Mm -hmm. I don't think Samsung. But they influence each other. Well, they influence each other. Mm-hmm. And there's probably even some employees over there at Samsung that are Apple customers sure. themselves, dare I say. Yeah. Not in front of the big dogs, though. No. But uh, somebody actually put a cool comment in here. Oh, by the way, let's just, according to a report from Business Korea, Kim Woo Pyong worked at Apple for the past nine years after taking his leave from Texas Instruments and Qualcomm. You see, I go Texas Instruments, you go Qualcomm, you go Apple, you go Samsung. I think you might know a thing or two. Uh -huh. um, report suggests that Kim was a semiconductor expert, but no roles and responsibilities have been mentioned. My thing is this probably happens all the time. I don't know why this particular story got picked up. There's not a tremendous amount of detail, but I like this one particular comment, which says there's a term for this, not cooperation, coopetition. You ever heard this term before, Will? Uh, can't say I have. It's like cooperation and competition hybrid. Sure. We push one another. The act of cooperation between competing companies. Businesses that engage in both competition and cooperation are said to be in coopetition. Certain businesses gain an advantage by using a judici judicious mixture of cooperation with suppliers, customers, and firms producing complementary or related products. This goes on. It goes on and on and on. You build one thing. They build one thing. We build better. They build better. We all get better. Mm -hmm. It's tactics. We learn from one another. Mm -hmm. We are humans. Are we? <laughs> I don't know. I did this idea that you've got these completely original things, and it's very rare that these things happen. Yeah. Most of the most of the time, if not all of the time, definitely all of the time, you are building upon what's already been built. Sure. I like this next one. It's my favorite thing in a long time. Yeah. It comes from Michael Stieber. He built a time machine, a time machine that sends you back to the air of iPods and boxed software, the Apple Store time machine. Uh... This experience is very soothing to me. Now, obviously, there's a heavy nostalgia component here because you're going back in time. He built an actual app. Now, you don't need to download the app in order to have the experience. Maybe you can give us some audio, Will, and just head to the Twitter account of Michael Stieber because he has screen captured a variety of these experiences at, a, at different Apple stores. There's the first Apple store, Tyson's Corner. 
then a mini Apple store from Stanford Shopping Center, then the iconic Fifth Avenue Apple store, and then the Infinite Loop store. Listen to this. You hear these footsteps? It's interactive and nostalgic, and you have the hum of the HVAC. <laughs> you know I love the hum of an HVAC. Sure, yeah. Uh, there's, th there's different elements for you to discover as you make your way through this time machine. There may be a video playing on a computer, a distant computer. Um, there may be a drawer that you can open. You, it's very mysterious and reminiscent of some of the old video games I used to play once upon a time, mm. which I appreciate. Mm -hmm. There's no clear objectives here, but it somehow the way that the spatial audio is uh, integrated along with the absence of activity, you get this natural explorative sensation of just looking around. And just the attention to detail. Tremendous. I noticed that um, there's a coil underneath the one of those display desks um, producing electricity. You know, it's it, it, listen. It's there nice. was actually quite a bit of research that went into this. You had to use old video footage in order because these many of these stores don't look like this anymore if they exist. Mm. And so you needed to go and research old video clips to find out what the layouts would have looked like in these in these moments and then you got to map it all out and you got to build it obviously it's very cool you can download it for free experience yourself or you can just head to michael steber's twitter account and uh and watch a video clip of walking around these spaces i'm a little weird and strange if you are as well this uh may create some sort of sensation for you as well Here's a weird one, Will. Napping regularly linked to high blood pressure and stroke. Study fine. Do you nap? Well, here's the thing. I read that headline and I'm immediately skeptical because there's been moments in my life, and again, you got to go in and read the fine details here to discover what's really going on. But there's been moments in my life where a nap totally resets. I feel so refreshed and capable. Now, that, now for the record. You go have one of those really long naps and you're all confused and you feel like you got punched in the head and you're like, what time is it? Where, what planet am I on? You one, feel more tired. If you go over an hour, that's not a nap anymore. That's a sleep. Yeah, that's a sleep during the that's day. That's night-night. And so essentially what this study is about is it's, it's, it's saying like a lot of people who have, who take naps aren't doing so as a supplementary thing. They're doing so because their nighttime sleep is probably poor to begin with which is the reason they're exhausted during the day and if you have poor nighttime sleep to begin with then the nap might not be sufficient to make up for it uh so they did this study and they determined that people who typically nap during the day were 12 percent more likely to develop high blood pressure over time were 24 percent more likely to have a stroke compared with people who never napped but i'm sitting there saying well the people who never nap maybe they go to bed at 8 p.m like I don't there's so many variables and factors and then I'm reading through the thing even further and then then I just realize how important it is to really look at the details of any of these things they do suggest a refreshing power nap to be 15 to 20 minutes around noon to 2 p.m. that's the way to go if you're sleep deprived mm -hmm. if you have chronic insomnia no encouragement for naps because then it takes away the drive to sleep at night if you're already having trouble sleeping at night, push yourself through to get to it so you're ac actually tired when you need to be yeah. to ease into the, the, impo the most important rest, which is in the evening. But then I read this part, which I'm like, okay. Most of the people in the study who took regular naps also smoked cigarettes, drank daily, snored, and had insomnia. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> well, why are they keeping the last well, paragraph? It's like... <laughs> You know, it's like, well, what are we doing over here? <laughs> <laughs> they tricked you. Those things might contribute. Uh, it's which came first, the chicken or the egg? Was I having trouble uh, sleeping, so I reached for the cigarettes and the alcohol? Or was I enjoying the cigarettes and the alcohol, which affected the, the sleep, the snoring correlation, or the uh. insomnia already being there? But So anyway, read it. You got to read it in a certain way. 
which is essentially that those who nap more frequently typically have a reason why they're napping more frequently. Right. And it's not that they're doing it from a health conscious perspective of I'm going to get 15 minutes before I head out to my next healthy activity and my next healthy meal and then my perfectly timed bedtime and my workout routine and so on and so forth. Mm. That if you're depleted to begin with, you might be more inclined towards sleeping half the day. If you're in terrible physical fitness, you might be more inclined towards sleeping half the day. Yeah. And if you're just, if, if you're not getting up and moving around, you can see why the body would send you some terrible signals. Mm -hmm. You can see why the body would turn into a sedentary mess. Yeah. So I think go for your 15 or 20 and don't overdo it because you'll mess up your evening. That's that's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, Facebook will give you ad revenue for putting Post Malone's music in your videos. Not just Post Malone. They use Post Malone to bait you in the headline. Creators can now monetize videos that draw from the platform's bank of licensed songs. They're trying to encourage you to use popular music, not unlike other platforms that have become inc incredibly successful doing the same, using the same tactics by incentivizing creators to stay within the legal bounds of music use on its platforms, Meta may be able to reassure the music industry that it takes copyright infringement seriously. So like, you're gonna get paid. Here's the way this would work. Uh, you would monetize your video, you would use the licensed music, you would then get 20% of the overall ad revenue, the rest of it would be distributed to Facebook and the rights holder of the music. 20% is not a big chunk, but maybe the only reason somebody wants to watch your video is because it has the hit track in it. I don't know how that will interact with the algorithm either. But you know what will probably happen. You'll use the Post Malone track. Next thing you know, you get uh, 20 million views and you're like, I don't mind this 20% mm -hmm. of the thing. Mm -hmm. Post Malone makes a bunch of money. The record labels love it. They say, hey, let's keep this little thing going. And the reason Facebook might be interested in that is because recently they had a bit of a disagreement, the lack of understanding, lack of new deal cut with music publisher Cobalt. Uh, they informed its, their writers and partners that its licensing deal with Meta expired and that it's in the process of taking 700,000 songs off of Facebook and Instagram. And of course, that reaches into Reels and they represent music uh, from the likes of uh, The Weeknd, Paul McCartney. I don't know if you heard of these guys. Mm -hmm. Big names. So Cobalt said, we have fundamental differences. We're not able to resolve and that essentially means we can't get the money we want or we can't get the cut that we want. We can't get the deal that we want uh, for our artists, for ourselves, and so on. And uh, obviously, that's not ideal for Meta. Meta was also taking heat from Epidemic Sound. Do you know them? Yeah. They do uh, sound or music licensing, right? Yeah, for people making videos on youtube and sure. things like this you would sign up for epidemic sound you would grab a track you would then get the license necessary licensing for your usage apparently i, I didn't know this epic epidemic sound claims that 1000 of its works have been uploaded to and used across meta's platforms without a license so mm -hmm. people just assume they can use it over there but what's interesting here is they're not going after the content creators but over the platform itself well platform itself makes a little more sense to sue if you're gonna right if i sue willie do what, what's gonna happen here if i sue mark zuckerberg what's gonna happen here yeah go for the zuck i mean i'm not suggesting anything you know yeah <laughs> i'm not don't I'm do that i'm just saying no suing uh, this is what meta says they say meta has created tools original audio and reels remix which encourage and allow its users to steal oh this is from epidemic sound Meta has created tools, original audio, and Reels Remix, which encourage and allow its users to steal Epidemic's music from another user's posted video content and use it in their own subsequent videos. So this is pretty specific, and actually they got a good point here. If, you, if a person does have the correct licensing, and they actually go on Epidemic Sound, they pay, and then I got this song, and, and I, I'm allowed to use it, and then the software, the social media company, creates a way for other users to just hit a button and reuse that audio. And they don't have the license. The new user doesn't. No. And they can just basically print that out, just pure uh, replication, bang, 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 bang. And then uh, in this case, Epidemic is saying, well, you have some degree of responsibility here because we can't possibly police this. And then our artists get upset because our artists only get paid when these licenses go out. Mm-hmm. 
So you can just imagine the complication here, but they go directly at Meta because they want these tools to be changed, sure. in which case maybe these tools would scan the audio and determine whatever database it's in and therefore it can't be reposted or the, whatever, the uh, Reels Remix, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Meta has declined commenting on that lawsuit, but they're getting uh, they're getting hit from all sides over here. And, but in the meantime, they're going to pump these other artists where they do have these agreements to prove to the record labels that they are very important and necessary for the future of music. Meta, Mark, don't sue Willie Do. No. Saudi Arabia wants to build a city dubbed The Line. And this was maybe... Our favorite story, I mean, maybe second favorite after walking around old Apple stores. No, this this one's the coolest. An ambitious project. This is a wall. It's a giant mirrored glass facade wall that you would live in. A new city planned to be built in Saudi Arabia from scratch, from scratch, dubbed the line. It'll probably get scratched as well, if you think about it. I, we, I was wondering if birds would fly into it. Then I'm like, it's in the desert. I don't know what kind of birds are over there. But, but it's so high. Have you ever had a it's window, you you, the, you ever heard the bird slam into the window? Yes. And you're just like, oh. And you go look. I've had this happen. I go look and the bird is laying there. You see the imprint? Oh, and I'm like, uh, okay, this bird is dead. Glass. This bird is dead. And then the bird will will just perk up, stare me in the eye and fly away. They just yeah. get KO'd it's for like, a why'd second. Why'd you do that? Yeah. He blames me for it. Yeah. Well, I don't know how this would work with this giant. They put the promotional video. It's all very intense. It's very science fiction. It's cool. Don't get me wrong. It's cool. There's a lot of questions that come from it, though. Mm -hmm. If you were going to put something like this somewhere in the desert, it sort of makes sense. Because now you can have this microclimate you've created uh -huh. with a limited amount of exposure to the elements. And they're showing it with tremendous greenery, the nature and the future together. They're promoting this 150 stories tall built from scratch, serve as a semi-enclosed environment where people can live and work without ever stepping foot outside. That's the part that got a few people in here a little scared. They say, oh, maybe I knew, maybe I want to step foot outside. I don't even know if future generations are going to know what it's like outside, Will. Yeah. Because once you're in here, and then you've got the VR to entertain yourself and so forth, and you're traveling around the world in such virtual fashions. I'm not saying that's what I want personally. I'm just saying this will be part of the sales pitch. The city is walled on four sides. It has ventilation on top, planned to be 500 meters long, no, 500 meters high, 200 meters wide, and 105 miles long, according to the promotional videos. Cutting edge technology and high speed transportation from end to end, so cars will be completely unnecessary. What a wild, this, oh, wild man. vision. This seems like so futuristic and just cool. It's just cool. A video uploaded to Twitter proclaims that the new city will house 9 million residents and provide a more healthy and sustainable quality of life. It's also being advertised as an eco-friendly project with water and power supplies billed as 100% renewable. Oh. I listen it's a challenge it's an ambitious concept the impl implementation is key maintenance is key um <laughs> claustrophobia is key or lack thereof but some of these climates are not the most hospitable to begin with yeah and you start thinking about futuristic ways of housing enormous numbers of people and I presume if you're in the desert, you spend a lot of time indoor in climate-controlled environments in 2022. Um, but it definitely looks like some some type of Star Wars. I just don't know if it's the evil group that lives in there. You know what I mean? In the movie, in the sci-fi movie? Because mm -hmm. you can imagine, Will, and this is what I was thinking, keeping people out becomes pretty easy as well. Mm -hmm. So somebody travels long distances in search of a better life, and it's just a giant mirrored wall facing them. Like, no, thank you. Definitely the rich. Well, like you got to assume. Affluent. How do you get in? Uh, you got to meet a certain crate. I guess that's like life to a certain extent. That can be like a street to a certain extent. But this thing is an actual wall. But we also talked about tourism. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. How uh, you could visit this place just for a couple of days and not live there, but experience this new way of living. Oh, and there was the other part I was thinking, which is 
it could be a precursor to interplanetary life. Wow. If you ever did actually mm. want to go to Mars or something, you would need a different version of this, but you can kind of get a, a little pre yeah. look at what that lifestyle might be like. A bit of like, like a, a biodome. What it might experience. be like to have your whole world exist inside of some kind of enclosure. Yeah. This one, for the record, is open to the sky, so you still see the sky. But everything else is inside the walls. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I got to ask people what they think. Let me know in the comments. Is this uh, terrifying? Is it inspiring? Are you excited by this? Or uh, will you be having nightmares of such things? Everybody's different. Yeah. Tesla has released impressive footage of a robot pulling a still smoking casting from the Giga Press. I mean, uh, Elon has talked about this extensively. They keep trying to get bigger and better ones. The idea here is much like a die cast car that you would have a little Hot Wheels or something like that. Mm. You can elimin eliminate the need for so many pieces for major car components by casting them using specific alloys and such. And there's this company, Idra or Idra, which is responsible for collaborating with Tesla and creating these advanced presses. Yes. huge scale presses and and this is a, this is essentially what it looks like this is i think a component from the rear, rear part of the vehicle that's being pulled out here and this piece that you're looking at uh, used to be far more pieces than it is now it used to be 70 different parts in the model y mm. replaced with this single rear body piece and the advantages here from a manufacturing standpoint is that you need you can use fewer robots to secure all these things together and um, assemble. And then also from a, from the vehicle perspective, you can eliminate some road noise. There's less things that less joints and things that are moving around, right? You have more solid pieces. Uh, if you are you on the article, if you scroll down, you can see exactly where in the car this piece fits. This press, yeah, there you go. This press is pretty wild. Clamping force of up to 61,000 kilonewtons get out of town. I don't even know. No, you don't need to know. You oh can boy. just, when you say 61,000 kilonewtons, you just know yeah. what you're dealing with. Uh, you can also see a little graph here of uh, the different Tesla models and the robot can't count per unit of manufacturing capacity. So you can see how much more efficient they're getting. And not needing so many robots. So the Model S made at Fremont, the old-fashioned Model S, still requiring uh, quite a few robots per unit of manufacturing capacity. Model 3 takes it down to a, a more efficient place. And then you can see the Model Y at the new facilities mm -hmm. in Berlin and Austin. And they're really finding even more efficiencies. There is some word that other automakers may look at these strategies and also attempt to implement them. Yeah. This is a weird story of a a young chess player, seven year old boy. I don't know if you saw this. Yes. A robot breaks the finger of a seven year old, a, a very talented, high high level uh, chess player. He's playing against the robot. Uh, the child continued his participation in the event even after his finger was placed in the cast. He just went on. He's like, I still got chess to play. Mm. But it's kind of a terrifying little clip where this chess-playing robot, it grabs physical pieces on a board. Mm -hmm. And you, the player, in this case, the seven-year-old, sits across from it. And he moves the pieces. And the Ooh. robot, I guess, believes that his finger is a piece and it just keeps clamping and it won't let go. Oh. And it squeezes the finger until it snaps. The oh. child made a move and after that we need to give time for the robot to answer but the boy hurried. The robot grabbed him. Sergei Lazarev, president of the Moscow Chess Federation. We have nothing to do with the robot. The robot broke the child's finger. This of course is bad. The robot was rented by us. It has been exhibited in many places for a long time with specialists. It happens. A coincidence? It is necessary, apparently, to warn the children additionally. It is extremely strange that this happened, but it happened. It happens. 
These are the quotes. Um, this child is one of the 30 strongest chess players in Moscow under nine years old. And the family isn't very happy about it uh, for obvious reasons. And I'm not sure the child will trust the robots in the future because his one of his initial encounters here led to a broken finger. Yeah. Just imagine that thing clamped on and squeezing and you can't get it off. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> I just can't get away from uh, just this very literal um, response. <laughs> Like, this is bad. This, of course, is bad. <laughs> this happens. Like, well, uh, well. It's, it seems like the implication is, yeah, the robot screwed up, but 99% of the time it doesn't, and therefore we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. It sounds kind of protecting of the robot, to be honest. Mm. Which is the child. Which is telling, which is definitely telling, but maybe it's also just the bluntness of how it's delivered. It because is very blunt. he does go on to say who, you, those responsible for the development of the robot are capable and should probably put some extra safety measures in there. Sure. It will be necessary to analyze why this happened. The robot has a very talented inventor. It may be necessary to install an additional protection system mm. is the remainder of the quote there. But I don't know that any of that will matter for the seven-year-old chess player. He will have the cast on now. and uh, just trauma. So, and yeah, it, was, it would be a very memorable interaction with a robot and not an ideal one. Yeah. Here's some strange recommendation to eat with your mouth open. Apparently this makes food taste better. I don't think. Also, that's a weird image. He is <laughs> chewing on cotton candy, cotton candy <laughs> but it's hard to figure it out it, unless you read the uh, subtext under the photo. Uh, a man enjoying candy floss to the full photograph, Tom Werner, Getty Images. It's like, wow. Somebody searched that up specifically, cotton candy. Uh, so, yeah, this is obviously frowned upon from an etiquette perspective, but research from the University of Oxford has revealed that chewing your food with your mouth open can help release volatile organic compounds. It's kind of like swishing wine around in a glass before you drink it. I guess you're getting more air into there. It's getting up into the nose and so forth. Um, the research revealed that opening your mouth can help aromatic compounds reach the back of your nose, in turn boosting your olfactory sensory neurons, which makes food taste better. It doesn't, you know why it doesn't matter, Will? Because if we're sitting there and we're all like, oh, I'm boosting my... Um, olfactory sensory neurons we're also going to be so disgusted looking into the chewed up portions of food in each other's mouths that it's not going to the olfactory thing's not going to click uh -huh. we're going to be like you know what let's go back to the old <laughs> it's way it's not very appetizing it's, exactly I'm like well it maybe it tastes marginally better but uh, it's all n none of it matters considering what I have to stare at now I'll take the sud the subtler flavor alongside the the etiquette but it does make you wonder how these things come to be mm -hmm. how people decide what is and isn't acceptable mm -hmm. um i also think that uh closing your mouth would probably keep the food in well physically yeah oh yeah there's gonna be less things falling out here flinging it around yeah flinging around i don't know whatever else goes with that the saliva going everywhere and the monkey pox or whatever <laughs> else <laughs> Yeah, I'm just, <laughs> no, I'm just saying, like, I don't know. There's got to be some downside. It's a weird article. It's, it's making the case for it in a kind of funny way, knowing that nobody would ever actually do it. But maybe if you were one of these food testers, if you were one of these high-level connoisseurs, mm. maybe you know some of these techniques to increase and enhance flavors. Maybe you eat by yourself anyway. Yeah. Because you need to focus. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's the last one. This is a strange one. I don't know if you've ever heard of such things, but... Did you know that cats sometimes get stuck in vending machines? Really? So I, you know how a cat likes to lounge with the, uh, the soft, the soft things. They will yeah. seek it out. They will find it. Well, we have a recent story of a cat stuck in a Walmart vending machine in New York and animal rescue got there. No cat was injured or harmed, which goes to show you probably wasn't in there for very long. 
First responders found a cat stuck inside a vending machine at Rockland County, New York, Walmart. Firefighters quickly got the situation under control and were able to get the cat out of the vending machine. So anyways, this was a situation that happened. This is local news. However, the image that you're seeing is from a viral video clip of a separate cat mm. being stuck in one of those vending machines which you, where you try to win a prize with the claw. Mm. And this video was in Dubai, and I had never seen this clip before. It was in the United Arab Emirates. And if you go to the video, and maybe you can just scroll it uh, a little bit lower... Just scroll it because it's a viral hog problem. Oh, no. It's a viral hog problem. Uh, but anyway, there's a cat laying there, and I don't even know at first glance if you would assume it was a live cat. Oh, that's very comfortable. I would just maybe at first think, hey, that, is that a really <laughs> tries to claw it. realistic <laughs> stuffed animal or something? Yeah, and he tries to claw it, which it wakes up and it's like, hey, man, don't claw me. As you can see. Uh, and then the guy goes on to try to get the Frosty the Snowman and fail because these machines suck. They're the worst. They do, yeah. The claw grips nothing. I presume that this cat was also saved at some point, but I don't know. I guess the cats can find a way <laughs> to... Tries again. <laughs> I guess they find a way to crawl in there. Yeah. And because they, they're surprisingly sneak. They can get into smaller areas than you think. They're so flexible. Well, why is a cat there in the first place? Yeah, I don't know. I don't have these answers. <laughs> okay. I, don't ha I don't have these answers, All but right. maybe cat owners can tell me how it is these things happen. Yeah. But this cat looks so damn comfortable in here. Looks like it was made to, meant to be. Well, mm. maybe every cat needs some sort of vending machine at home. Never mind the fluffy little bed. They want the enclosure, you know, the security of the enclosure, mm. the den. They all want to lay beside Frosty the Snowman. I don't. These are not real answers. This is just life in 2022. Mm -hmm. You're either a cat in a vending machine or you're living in a futuristic city in Saudi Arabia, which is actually a mirrored wall with no access to the outdoors because mm. you don't need it. It's harsh out there. The world has ended. You have the warm and healthy embrace of your wall. Yeah.